Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program... Uh, kind of a shorter intro than I've been doing lately. As you know, I've been experimenting over the past, I don't know, five, six, seven episodes with a more expansive and a more detailed and a more personalized intro to these episodes. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure those intros are serving a whole lot of worthwhile purpose a lot of the time. And probably some of you are skipping right past them. So, I had just finished one for this episode with Chris Banks, the wonderful Canadian poet. And I was beginning to edit, and I was listening to it, and I thought, you know what? I don't need to tell people how to feel about this episode. Back when I was doing the London Groove Machine blog, the tagline was letting artists and their music speak for themselves. And the whole premise was I did a lot of long-form interviews on the website, but uh, mostly it was just them doing the talking. And yeah, I think sometimes with the podcast, the most effective thing is just to let the guests be the guests. And so I think I'm going to do that this time around. What I will say is that this interview with Chris Banks surprised me a little bit. And it's another reminder from these people who are doing their thing at the highest level that what got them there is doing the work. And for me, that's a really important reminder because sometimes you struggle. Uh, I struggle with writing a lot of the time. I still continue to fight with that. But it was a reminder from Chris that all you can do is the work. And, you know, when he reached the darkest point of his life, which got pretty dark, as he will tell you. His response to that was to double down on poetry. It was to commit himself even more completely to his passion and what he loved. And in the end, that's what saved him. You may not be looking at your art to save you, but man, if you want to accomplish something, if you want to be a Tyler John Olson or a Denny Goche or a Danny Miles or a Chris Banks or whatever being that means to you, you've got to do the work. We talked a little bit about Stephen Pressfield and the War of Art and this concept that a pro does the work. An amateur waits for the muse, a pro sits down, muse or no muse, and does the work. For me, that was an important thing. And it gave me a lot to think about, and I appreciate Chris for that. But I'm going to let him talk about that rather than me. What I'm going to talk about is gratitude, because it's a Monday night, and I got home yesterday from a weekend on the road. I played a couple of really great shows at something called the Great Canadian Kayak Challenge in Timmins, Ontario, which is the Paris of that small region, Northern Ontario. Great little city, and I've been trying to be more grateful lately. And I've been making a point of gratitude. I've been looking for gratitudes, gentle listener. Sometimes it's easy to feel like you're not getting where you want to get to, or it's easy to be impatient, or it feels like things just aren't going where you want them to go. And when you start sliding down that slope, you can slide fast and you can slide far. And I have slid at times, my dear friends. I have slid with my optimism, I have slid with my hope, and what that does is bring down the energy all around you, and usually nothing good comes from that. So I've been making a point of gratitudes, a plural, gratitudes. And this weekend, playing that festival, I made a point of being aware of where I was and who I was with, which was Sarah Smith and Denny Goche and Ken Ross, and man, I'm very, very lucky to be on the road with some of my best friends and some of the best people I know. Out there playing music on a really nice stage with an audience, a crowd. And, man, that's a lucky thing. So I made a point of taking a mental picture. There's an article on my blog about taking mental pictures. Making a point of noticing your surroundings. Making a point of noticing how lucky you are. And... For me, 
I felt really lucky this weekend to be out there playing, to be playing well, to be playing good music with great people and musicians. And so I'm grateful. And I have a tour coming up to Europe with Sarah, which is mind blowing to me still. Even now, it's mind blowing to me that that can happen. And I keep saying good things happen when you put yourself out there, and I continue to be my own proof, and you should be your own proof as well. So today, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this show. I'm grateful for you, gentle listener. I'm grateful to Chris Banks for coming on and giving me and the collective we of the podcast a bit of a kick in the butt about what it means to produce art and what being a professional is. And he's a good man to talk about it, man, because he's about to release his fifth collection. He's a critically acclaimed poet. Uh, He's, you know, making his way into the pantheon of a very rich and vibrant Canadian poetry legacy. He's the real deal. And it was just great to get his insights on where this comes from and what it means to him. And as he gets older and becomes sort of a, what he calls, mid-career poet, how his perspective changes on what matters. The accolades don't matter. The poems matter. And he's not precious about it. It's like he does the work because he loves the work. And this is what he has to do. And man, I need that lesson. Some of you maybe need that lesson about really buckling down and dedicating yourself to whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is that comes out of you or wants to come out of you. Really doubling down on that and going for it like a professional. And I thank Chris for that. I thank you for listening. This short intro is creeping into regular intro length and territory. So I'm going to cut it off now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I certainly did. And uh, hey, roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is Chris Banks, the Iron Poet, (laughs) reading from his new collection, Midlife Action Figure. Go for it, man. All right. So I have a poem here uh, called Tom Swift. I used to read these uh, novels in the 70s. I don't know if other people did. They were at my cottage called Tom Swift Jr. He was an inventor. And I wrote this poem for my new collection. I have a minor crush on Saturn's moons, Callisto, Io, and Titan. The rent is too high. I read once about a boy inventor who built rocket ships, dark forces, mysterious agents, always conspired against him. Leaving the planet for the vacuum of space was an easy decision. Meanwhile, the first time you are hurt in love, you discover the body is a spacesuit with a lifetime supply of oxygen. Floating untethered leaves you gasping, come back to me, you say. Those words bleed through to the suit's interior where you feel trapped. Try to make it to the ship's bridge. I built model rockets as a kid, launched them from a yellow field. I never intended to vacate this world. NASA says they have found exoplanets in outer systems that can support life. Still, no nude beaches in space, no comic cons, foie gras, or walking clinics either. As you get older, you feel the pull of gravity more, dreams less. On the way home from school one day, you notice you're being followed. Your father is a brilliant scientist. Why has he been kidnapped, taken to a secret moon base? You head for a launch pad. Your rocket is waiting. No nude beaches in space. (laughs) Tell me about that poem. All right. I I don't know. This is a weird collection because it's so different than the type of books that I've written in the past. When I first started writing poems, you know, I wanted to capture a sort of verisimilitude. You know, I wanted to try to capture the past, you know, my childhood, the places where I grew up and hold those moments um, in time. 
in a poem, you know, and that required a certain amount of emotional sincerity. And, uh, but as I got older, you run out of childhood. Right. <laughs> you have to talk about other things in a poem. And uh, so for, for this collection, I decided I wanted to do something really fun. I wanted to write a book of light surrealism. I, I didn't want to know where the poems were going. Uh, I wanted to literally sit down at the computer and just start writing and see where the poem would take me. And that's where this whole collection sort of grew out of. Um, so yeah, Tom Swift Jr. I just like thought of that, um, of that memory. And I wrote this poem and yeah, each line sort of surprises you really? as you, uh, go through the poem. So that's exciting to me. And, uh, so yeah, I'm calling this book, uh, a book of light surrealism with, um, hopefully the odd, uh, little nugget of wisdom, uh, interspersed in there. But yeah, that's what the book's about right now. And the title is midlife action figure. Yes. The second title is midlife action. Figure. That's right. Tell me about this title. Well, the first title of the book was called The Book of the Dead for Dummies, <laughs> which we loved. Uh, but then we sent uh, sort of a request to the dummies book people, uh, and they sent back a cease and desist letter. So we had to, we had to change the title on the fly. But uh, Midlife Action Figure actually ha has become my preferred title. It wasn't my first love, but it's now, of course, um, really grown on me. And there's a poem in the collection called Midlife action figure and yeah this is a poem about getting older or a book about getting older and you know seeing your life with a certain amount of irony and distance and hopefully experience that you don't have when you first start writing poems I've been writing poems now for 30 years and uh, it's only been the last 15 that I would say that I've been you know really writing good poems and um now, of course, uh, you know, it's funny. My life seems so less interesting uh, as a subject for, for my poems, because for me, I want the poems to really have a life of their own uh, beyond myself. And so I'm really careful about how much of myself I put into the poems now. Really? Yeah. Are you guarded about it? No, I'm not. I just, well, maybe I am. I don't know. I think when you're young, you want to be a poet and you want to redo lots of readings and have people fawn over you or right. tell you that you're a good poet because, um, you know, you need that. You have a certain amount of willfulness and ego and, you know, <laughs> there's no real good reason to write poems other than, <laughs> you know, because you have to, right? Uh, so any little nugget of praise that you get from anyone, you know, you hold on to that. But as I've gotten older, I, those things matter much less to me. I, I know I need to write and, uh, you know, it's just been such a part of my adulthood, at least it, as well as my teenage years that, uh, um, I just, uh, it's just second nature to do it, but yeah, you know, I've already gotten one really good review that's coming out in September in Quill Inquirer magazine. Awesome. So it's nice that people are receiving the book. Uh, well, there's a little bit of buzz, uh, CBC books has talked about it as being a fall collection to watch, which is always great, but you know, ultimately I'm writing the poems for myself and yeah. you know, if, there's uh, uh, an appreciative reader and lets me know, of course, I, I, I love that. I love that it, it's connecting with an audience, but it's just not as important to me as it, say, was in my early 30s when I was single and needed some sort of validation that this was my path. Uh, that's so important. Yeah. This is on my mind a lot lately as mm -hmm. I sort of juggle music and a failed fiction career and uh, you know all the other sort of stuff that comes along to you at this point in your life right when you begin to develop a certain amount of wisdom and you begin to i think you begin to understand the world a little bit mm -hmm. or you begin to understand how little you understand the world you know what i mean absolutely and i think a lot about what's important in yeah. terms of accolades or attention or, sure or um 
getting that kind of validation from outside of, of you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a thing that I think about a lot and I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one. No, absolutely. You know, like I, I remember, uh, in my twenties, I did, um, masters in uh, creative writing at Concordia university. And I wrote a book length manuscript and it, that was a failed book. And I knew it was a failed book. I defended it as my thesis and got my, uh, master's degree. But I remember leaving Montreal, uh, after having done my thesis defense and just feel like I'm a failure. I have failed at, at this thing that I've wanted so much for myself. Uh, and, <laughs> It's interesting, you know, as soon as I got out of academia and uh, I got a little bit of distance from it, I started writing really well because there was no one around to tell me that I'm writing well or not writing well. Right. Uh, It's just, I have to write these poems and this is part of who I am. And then I really knuckled down too. So I think a certain amount of failure is good. Uh, it certainly teaches you to be a um, sort of merciless editor. You know, I'm my own worst editor. It, it, it's, <laughs> the poem has to, you know, has to pass a smell test to me before right. I send it on. Right. I have my girlfriend, Aura, who loves all my poems. And she's always shocked when I say, oh, you know, the basketball poem. She's like, I love that poem. I go like, yeah, no, it's not going to be in this book. I, you know, I, I've, I taken it out. I don't like it. Um, you know, there's always a new poem on the horizon. So I, right. that's, no, that's, that's not to interrupt you, but sure. that's an important thing. There's always another poem on the horizon. Yeah. Right. Cause I think a lot of artists don't have that faith. I, I struggle with that faith. Like mm-hmm. there's another gig on the horizon. Yeah. There's another opportunity on the horizon, you know, uh, have you always had that faith? No. Really? No. I think uh, I used to be very sort of defensive. And once, you know, you get up to about a 40-page manuscript, you really want to just say, uh, protect it, you yeah. know, nurture it, and, and just say, this is this is so important to me. Whereas now, I'm just, I don't worry about those things. I worry about the individual poems, and I put them together. And when I do have enough strong poems together, then I start thinking manuscript. I start thinking about the descriptive copy. How am I going to package this as a book? But ultimately, before that happens, I'm just looking at the poems and and saying, is this strong enough? Will I be happy if I see this in print? And, right. and you know, it's funny because I, I think I'm a, like a lot of artists where I – the last thing I've written, I never like. I need at right. least uh, a week uh, reflection to look at it with with proper eyes, because you know I'll I'll write a poem and I'll say, oh, I don't really like this, and or I will say, oh, this is a really wonderful poem. Look at this image, and I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure yet. And then the poem I wrote second last, which I didn't like a week ago, all of a sudden is so much more interesting. Really. Yeah, and so much more um, wise or insightful or surprising in some way, Um, you know, beautiful. Um, And I mean, I've gotten used to that's my process that I never like the last thing that I've written. I always, the poem's always so much better in my head than, than what I get down on the page. But as I get older, you know, the gap between those two things is closing. I feel like I'm on, um, my confidence is at an all time high. Good. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, after 30 years, I can say, I know what I'm doing, even though, you know, when I say to people, you know, I'm a writer and they ask what I write and I say, well, I'm a poet. It's always a little bit of embarrassing (laughs) to say that, you know, um, but it's, it is what it is. So. How did poetry start for you? Where did this come from? Well, I think I'm like a lot of people, you know, I I, I have an artistic temperament, um, but I wasn't very artistic in the traditional sense. Right. You know, I wasn't very good at art, um, but I enjoyed art. Um, My mom took me to a lot of performances as a kid. Um, 
And so I was exposed to music and art. I tried playing guitar as, as a teenager and, you know, could play three chords, maybe, maybe seven or eight. That's enough for a punk band. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I, I, I still felt like "Mm, this isn't really for me. I feel like I'm just trying to find my way. And then when I first read the poems of Al Purdy and Earl Burney, um, they, for one, were poems about places I had been, you know, uh-huh. like I read Earl Burney's David and I had been to Banff and Jasper Park and that area of of the of Canada. And you read A Country North of Belleville by Al Purdy and it's describing a particular type of landscape and smack dab north of Belleville is a little town called Bancroft. And I lived in Bancroft from the time I was four till the time I was 11. So that was super exciting for me. Right. And I think that's how it starts. You know, it's like one person experience talking to another person's experience. Donald Hall, the American poet said, a poem is inside talking to inside. Uh, the poet Stephen Dobin says a poem is uh, a window that hangs between two different people who otherwise live in darkened rooms. And wow. that's was the experience for me was all of a sudden, Purdy's life experience touched 16-year-old Banks's, you know, life experience. <laughs> and that just, I'm getting kind of, you know, goosebumps I even can see think, it, yeah. thinking about it. And so that little charge that I, I love that and that I could have that experience every time I, re- I read that particular poem or those poems. And so that led me to write uh, my own poetry but it wasn't very good by any stretch of the imagination i teach high school and i teach youngsters who write better poetry than i did in, in high school you know every year but i think the difference for me was just sheer you know self-willfulness uh right. sheer stubbornness that uh you know i don't think other people that Talent Talks Genius Does, said Theodore Ruthke. Whoa, that's and, intense. Yeah, and what he, he means by that, I think, is there's lots of talented people who talk. Right. Who talk a good game. Yes. But the people who are really the influencers or transcenders or whatever you want to call them, um, they work. They just, they've got their nose down, nose to the funk stone, nose to the writing stone, and they're doing it. And I always think of that for me when anyone disparages my writing in review or I just feeling down about myself is just write, write hard, write fast, write better, outright. Wow. Everyone. Poetry is therapy. Yeah, exactly. So. That's interesting because when I feel down about myself, I want to just stop doing everything. No, for me, I'm just, it's, it's go time. It's needs to, let's just, interesting. you know, I want to write five poems and if four are bad, well, one is going to be good and that's all that matters. So, wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Cause I struggle with this all the time as a musician. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, well, A, I hate everything I ever recorded. <laughs> right yeah and i drive people crazy in the studio because it's like let me do one more take let me right. do one more take and they're like yeah. dude the first take was great we're good they're like no 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 no, no. i can do better i can yeah. do better i can do it's the same sort of thing like never being happy with the last thing i did although i am happy with the last thing i recorded which is a john couture record which is not out yet cool but man yeah for me the impulse is to shut down like i suck at this i'm done i'm out I don't know why I'm not like that. I'm just not wired like that. I think there was times in my writing career where I did have that sort of feeling. I know when Winter Cranes, my third book came out, uh, that's a book that's about 40 to 50% uh, written in something called syllabic. So there uh, a lot of the poems are written in a very strict seven syllable line or right. a strict 10 syllable or 12 syllable line, but you don't necessarily, the poems don't read as formal. Okay. As you read them, you don't notice it unless you were literally counting the syllables. And I remember not putting on the jacket copy that this was a very formalist book mm-hmm. and v- no one, none of the reviewers 
pick that up. They didn't notice? No, they didn't. And in fact, I had one review that said, well, you know, this is very narrative, but, you know, I like formal poetry and I just about tore my hair out. And it was at that point where I, I, I guess I didn't write for a couple of years. Maybe I would have written some like three or five poems a year but that's nothing that's not your normal output. that's not my normal output and that lasted for about five years and in that five years i i was very depressed and my marriage um came to an end and i separated uh and so when i was moved into my new house and uh, you know i'm not with my children um 100 of the time anymore yeah it really was like for me, I had it, I sort of looked myself in the mirror and said, okay, if, if your marriage is coming apart and you, you've got to create this sort of new life for yourself, let's make it worth it. Let's really wow. go for it as, as a poet. Let's see what will happen if you just decide, I'm going to try to write all the time, knowing you're going to fail at that, but trying to write all the time is going to generate more work than, say, you know, I'm I, I'm not very good, or you know, all those voices that get into your head. Right. Um, so you, I just pushed those voices aside, and I knocked out a about two thirds of a book in three months. Wow! And that became uh, my book, um, uh, the Cloud versus Grand Unification Theory, which is a hilariously long title. That's a hell try of a title. To, yeah. Try to market that, you know, <laughs> uh, but. Th- that was a breakthrough book for me. Really? My voice changed. How did it change? Well, before that, it was very narrative, very lyrical, and I sort of mastered a particular, you know, uh, voice, I would say, in my first three books. And, but the voice changed. All of a sudden, it was like, you know, time is marching on. And right. if you're going to write something important, um, you need to do it. Like that's what it boils down to. I, I sort of hit this sort of midlife moment, crisis or epiphany, call it what you will. And yeah. uh, the poems became much more, came out much faster where I would often take, you know, a month to write a poem, especially if I was writing in a strict syllabic line, they might even take, you know, two months to write a poem. I was writing a poem in, you know, five hours yeah. and, and putting it aside and then trying to write another poem in about five hours the next day or in three days from then. And I was coming out with some really interesting poems, which were super exciting as well as making me very anxious because really? I was like, this is a voice that I'm not familiar with. Right. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with it, even though the poems were so surprising and so interesting to me. Um, but it turned out generally people liked it. I, I got the book reviewed in the Globe and Mail and in the Toronto Star. So uh, that kind of gave, there was some critical uh, uh, reviews of it too, but generally it was well received. And so that just pushed me to write midlife action figure and i wrote this book in about five and a half months just yeah. it just poured out of me that's so exciting yeah it really was you know i had heard of other poets that did this sort of thing and i was like just once i want to write a po- a book that really really fast yeah that i'm not worried about anything other than just does it bring joy is it make me happy right and uh and that's how midlife action figure came out. The previous book was this a healing process for you? Yeah, it was. Think? You know, it it was a book of Lacloud versus Grand Unification Theory. It was a basically the premise of that book was how do you continue to be an artist, be a poet in the age of YouTube stars, right? Where some kid, you know, who's got, you know, 70,000 followers for doing ridiculous things online right. is going to reach that much, that many more people than yeah. say yeah. you who are trying to create something artistic of value. You know, right. it's like the portrait of the artist as internet sensation. Right. You know, uh, so that was 
so it's a book about loss. It's about the things that have changed that are no more um, in, you know, like the 20th century is gone. And so much of the things we grew up with yeah. are, are gone. Eight tracks or cassettes or, you know, <laughs> On and on and on and on and on. It, it's sort it's sort of a litany of loss in one way, and in another way, it's a, a sort of a catalog of my anxieties about climate change, and um, you know uh, what else? You know, mental illness. I have um, uh, major depressive uh, depression. Yeah, uh, that uh, rears its head every couple of years, and I take medication for. So I. I was dealing with that in that book as well. Just th this idea of, you know, I, am I mentally ill because of how the world is, right. you know, like yeah. it, things are, are at such a schizophrenic pace, you know, in terms of how we process information through, you know, smartphones now. Right. It's uh, so the whole book was, me just grappling with these ideas, you know, how, how to create art, how to create meaning in, um, a limitless YouTube channel yeah. universe, you know, it's. And an often meaningless one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that was what that book was about. So it was a little more anxious, a little more serious of a book than midlife action figure is. Yeah. And now you've got all whimsical. And then I had to get, yeah, after a really heavy book, it was time to write something more joyful, more yeah. whimsical, more optimistic, perhaps. Yeah. More outward looking. Yeah. It takes, it takes, I would think, a certain amount of confidence to let this book come out. It, yeah, absolutely it was. Yeah. It was a social experiment. Really? And I was like, I'm going to write hard for six months and then we'll see if it, it's a book or if I like it or, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to second guess myself. Yeah. And the poems just roared out at me. That's so, so great. Yeah. It was really neat. I've had that experience when I was, when I was a functional fiction writer, I've had books pour out of me and there's nothing quite like that feeling of flow. Absolutely. Right? Like remember, um, I was living in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is like 1999-ish. So this is how long ago we're talking about here. And uh, I was writing my second novel that didn't get published. And uh, in the cupboard, we're going to do a neat tie-in here, but they're in the cupboard in this, in this little apartment we were living in, in Japan, this four tatami room apartment where I would hit my head on the doorframe every day because I was too tall for that place. <laughs> so you'd be in real trouble over there. Well, you lived in Korea, you know yes. what it's about. And uh, this had been an apartment for traveling English teachers for a while. The program had owned it, so we were not the first. And in this little closet was a bunch of books that people had left behind, one of which was Life After God by Douglas Copeland, right? Nice. Which has since become arguably the most influential book on me as a fiction writer. And... When I got home from that, I had written this this manuscript for a second book, which uh, I set aside because this other thing wanted to explode out of me. And the catalyst was life after God. And in the matter of a few months, I burst out this novel that I called No One You'd Know, which was my third novel. And it was just every day, just whoosh, you know, it was awesome. It was so beautiful and it felt so good. No, nothing I've ever done has felt like that before. Yeah, I think for me, again, I just got to a point where it's like, do you feel good as calling yourself a poet in 95, 98% of the time not writing? Or do you feel better about calling yourself a poet and maybe trying to write every day, just sitting down at the desk, at the computer, um, and just waiting to see if something will happen. Right, and I decided right. that's what makes me happy is that feeling of channeling something other than yourself right. through you yeah. onto a page or onto a computer screen. And once I realized that's what makes me happy, then all the other nonsense, you know, there are a lot of, 
there's a school of thought that says, you know, writing's supposed to be really hard. Right. Really difficult. And it is when you're starting. It's that, that's painful, like this painfully difficult. That's this romantic notion we have of the struggling artist and he's yeah. he's whacked out on you know, opiates and this is like a hundred yeah. years ago, you know, and he's a wreck and it's really hard and it's exactly. this thing. I flow does not look like that. No, no. For so for me, you know, I just realized I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, even my worst poem is better than well, most people who are just starting out <laughs> right. for, for sure. You know, and I don't mean, I, it just, that's the truth. And so once I c- came to that sort of realization, I was just like, it's time to work. Let's just get the work in, you know, like actors, they don't sit around, and, uh, you know, um, worrying about, well, maybe they do, but they go to work. Right. They they do a 16 hour day. They put in the work uh, when they w- they get a job. And I feel like if you're a poet, you should should just do the work and worry about it afterwards. But, right. you know, whether it's good or not, you know, I'm a. An editor who, uh, you know, has learned to, to edit. I, when I was younger, it was really painful, but now it's just second nature. So I'm yeah. just like, let's worry about getting the writing done and the editing will take care of itself. You have to develop this mindset of the work is the reward. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's the Stephen Pressfield thing, the War of Art thing. Have you read the War of Art? No, I haven't. Stephen Pressfield is a writer and and he wrote a series of what I suppose you would call motivational books or personal development books about the process of writing and as an extension of creating art. Mm. And exactly what he said is you show up at nine o'clock, whether you feel like it or not, Yeah, whether the muse is there or not. No, absolutely. You sit down and you work and that's what pros do. He has, he makes this differentiation between an amateur and a pro. Mm -hmm. And that's, one of the keys to it is the pro sits down at that desk and writes. Yeah. Whether, you know, you sort of know that you're just writing shit that day. Yeah. Uh, it's time to just at least do it for a little while. And um, maybe you only get one line out of out of 30 that particular day. But yeah. maybe that one line becomes the beginning of a really fantastic poem the, next, the next day. And if you can be... If you can be happy because you sat down and did that work for its own sake, yeah, then you're getting somewhere. Absolutely. Whereas that's... somebody like me in my current fragile state would panic. I only got one good line. Uh, and I would go off and madly in all directions and destroy my creative impulse altogether. See, it's interesting for me because uh, I've sort of started to try to do this thing where – when, um, for instance, when the cloud versus grand unification theory was accepted, I had about two years, a year, year and a half, two years before it was going to be published. So often in the past, I just sort of sat on my laurels worrying. Really? Worrying about this, <laughs> my baby that's going to be launched into into the big bad world. And with um the cloud once it got accepted i was like no it's time to really knuckle down yeah. let's you know double down and and write hard and see if we can't get another book written ready ready yeah for when the cloud comes out have another one already done and the, my thinking behind that was if the reviews come in and they're not very good, I'm not going to really worry because it's not my new baby. It's not your thing. Right? It's not my thing. It's yeah. two years old and I have this whole new baby, this whole new child, this whole new right. um, thing to worry about. And so that's what happened. <laughs> Literally, uh, you know, the cloud versus granification theory came out two years ago in September and I had midlife ready to go. And wow. I, I, I had sent it to my publisher uh, and they accepted it. They thought this is was extraordinary. Um, and uh, I, now midlife action figure comes out next month, and I'm almost done. Another, Are you really? 
a poetry collection called Deep Fake Serenade. Uh, I'm 42 poems deep into a new manuscript. I'm hoping to get to about 47 to 50. Uh, and again, it's it's great seeing that people are really reacting to midlife action figure, but I've I'm already on to other things. And right. I think again that idea of being trying to be a professional, trying to be uh, always one step ahead of um the whole marketing and publishing part right. of it. Right. But what's interesting is, you know, mid career it's an interesting place to be. Yeah. Because you know, you're writing way better you're right. than you did when you first started out. Like my first book, Bonfires, was up for a couple of awards in Canada, won the one award, the Jack Chalmers CAA Poetry Award in Canada for, for um, you know, book published in uh, 2004. Uh, it was uh, for the Gerald Lampert Award for Best First Book of Poems in Canada. It was shortlisted for that. Uh, so, you know... I got a lot of attention yeah. my first yeah. first year uh, of having a book out. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, I'm a mid-career poet now. I'm not an emerging poet. Right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, attention. And, well, you know, and they deserve it. You know, the, the, the young poets coming out in Canada now are just amazing. But it's harder to um, sort of capture the public's eye when you've, you're have you a little bit older now, right. a little bit wiser. But the irony, of course, is your poems are better, right. much better than they were uh, when you were first starting out. So it's an interesting place to be at in my career. It's um, the same in music. Yeah. It's the same in music. You could be, if there's a band that lasts five albums anymore, right. you know, you're five albums in and you're like, yeah, okay. But look at this new band. Yeah, uh, no, it's this, true. This young, shiny thing. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. I yeah. get it. I get it. Tell us the Douglas Copeland story. Oh, okay. We're talking about bonfires and Jack Jones. Yeah, sure. Um, That's where I, I was going with Life After God. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I uh, came out with my book, uh, Bonfires, in 2004, it won the Jack Chalmers Award, and I was flown out to vancouver to do an award ceremony and uh which was really nice and while i was there we did a reading and i had won for the poetry um category and douglas copeland had won for the fiction category and i believe um uh Stuart McLean won for the nonfiction category. Right. So I was doing readings with these heavy hitters and I was just a young guy, 34. And so I went, to, this is an embarrassing story. I went to um, <laughs> this shirt shop in, in Waterloo that was way, you know, I had no business being in that store. It was so expensive. And I bought two shirts each for about $275 each. Hello. Wow. And they came in like shirt bags. That's the kind of thing where you leave the, the store. Anyways, I put this one shirt on and I felt like, you know, if I'm going to read with these guys, I want to feel sort of like I deserve to be there. And so I, for whatever <laughs> reason, I felt like this shirt would, would uh, help me um, assuage my you know, low self-esteem and get the clothes me through. make the man. My yeah. Friend. Get, get me through this experience. And so I went up and I did my little reading and I heard Douglas Copeland, uh, laugh had a couple of my little jokes and I thought that was really great. Hey, and that's then I, awesome. I sat down and then he went up to do his reading and he immediately started by saying, uh, he's not going to read from the book that he, um, won the award for because he had another book already completed and he was more interested in that. And he said, uh -huh. and he started talking about how the new book was like a new shirt and that the old book was like an old shirt. And he says he's much more interested in this new shirt that he, and then he segued to look straight at me and said, speaking of shirts, that shirt on Chris Banks, where did you get that shirt? That is a fantastic shirt. <laughs> And it left me kind of speechless and I kind of laughed nervously. And then he went on with his reading. And then, of course, Stuart McLean went up and, you know, 
surveyed the crowd and then looked dead right at me and right at Doug and said, you're right, Doug, that shirt is a fantastic shirt. <laughs> and then later that night, um, there, you know, at the award ceremony, they, they wanted to pipe us all in as the award ceremony. So I had to stand in the hall with the two of them. Right. And while they were going to do the announcements of the winners of the various categories, we we're standing in the hall the two of them were rifling with the collar of my shirt to find out who made the shirt. It was an Italian designer shirt. That's all I remember about it. And then of course, drinking began to ensue and various people were coming up to me uh, saying things like do the right thing, sell Doug the shirt. I'm like, I remember thinking I'm not selling Doug a shirt. I don't care if he is Douglas Copeland. No, this is a great story. I'm going to tell this story for the rest of my life. And uh, it it got to a point where I decided I would sell the shirt. Half of the – I didn't want to say how much I spent on the the shirt. But I did say that I would give half the proceeds to charity and half proceeds would go to me because I wanted to recoup the money for this expensive shirt. And they immediately did a raffle. <laughs> and needless to say, Douglas Copeland bought the shirt for about nine hundred bucks. Did he really? Yeah, I didn't know it was that much. Yeah, so I I got four hundred and fifty dollars. Four hundred and fifty dollars went to a writer's charity, and uh, then he swooped off with the shirt tied around his neck like a cape because he was off to I I don't know Germany or someplace like this for a, a book fair. And, you know, I was like, am I going to ever get this money? You know, I I quickly wrote down my address and he swooped off. And sure enough, about two weeks later in the mail, I got this funny little note from Douglas Copeland with a check saying, great night, Chris. You know, here's a stupid government or company check. Ha ha ha. Douglas Copeland. And yeah, it was fun. Do you still have that note? I don't. I don't know what happened to the note. I should have uh, kept it, I suppose. But. That's so funny. And got lost in the move. The weird things that happen. Yeah, I know. Exactly. I, I met Douglas Copeland around the same time. It was 03 when I met Douglas mm-hmm. Copeland. Pivotal night for me uh, as a writer. Because at that point, I was still in the throes of it. Mm-hmm. I was still deep, knocking out fiction. And as I said, I'd read Life After God, and, and uh, it had been a huge influence on me. I didn't know you could write that way. Have you read that book? I haven't read that one. I've it's, written others of his. It's a really, uh, it's a first person narrative, really personal, really beautiful, but really scattered. Like it gets described as a book of short stories. Right. I don't see it that way. I see it as one story that's just very kind of episodic and all over the place. Okay. But he has a, in his best work, a peculiar brilliance, an ability to see beauty in the mundane, which incidentally you have as well. Oh, thank you. In your work. You, you can find a moment. You know what I mean? Yes. Something that other people don't notice. But you can see some beautiful thing and profound thing. And Doug has that too. And I didn't know you could write this way. It's stupid, right? Because I'd just done a degree in English literature. I'd read all the stuff. Yes. You know? And it had never occurred to me that you could write this confessional way in this beautiful way. And so it was a huge thing for me. And I'd come home from Japan and banged out that novel that was kind of the residual of that discovery and i had it in the back of my head because douglas copeland and i seem to be on about the same sorts of things culture and religion mm-hmm. and whatever and this sort of vacuous society and what are we all doing he's way better at it than me he's douglas copeland but i had it in my head that he and i were the same you know because mm-hmm. we write the same sorts of things sure. and i'm inspired by his work and how come he's so good and I'm not? So, you know, anyway, so I went to this reading he did in London. And I think he was reading from Hey Nostradamus at the time. Right. And so I stood in line with the copy of Life After God that I got in Japan. It was my it was the day before my 30th birthday, I think. And uh, I went up and I chatted with Douglas Copeland and I gave him the book and we talked about BC. And I realized... He and I are not remotely alike at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it was back to the drawing board. It's like, oh, okay. He has his own. He's Doug. I have to discover me. 
and write from that place. Right. Which I, I never did. <laughs> I kept writing, but I never quite discovered it. You know what I mean? Here's the other thing about Douglas Copeland that I find very inspiring is that guy is prolific beyond oh, yeah. words. Not just in terms of his writing, but in terms of art. His or art, yeah. Or doing, you know, whatever it is he's doing, he's always working hard. Yeah. Um, and so those are the people that inspire me. People like um, Doug Copeland or someone like Bob Hickok, who actually... Uh, blurb the back of my book uh he's an american poet who works very very hard and he publishes quite a bit and i just decided i wanted to be more prolific i wanted to be more um work oriented and where my writing is concerned and and not worry about you know the people who are saying well you know uh you should take more time with your writing. I think, you know, I, I took a lot of time in my sort of uh, apprenticeship uh, in poetry, yeah. much more time than a lot of people uh, who are coming up. They're great. They're much better than I was in my 20s. I I'm unbel- can't believe how good the, yeah. the young people are yeah. coming into the poetry scene in, in Canada. They're have some extraordinary new voices but you know my apprenticeship i feel like is is over and it's time to really uh write i love that this explosion of output has not come from some kind of romantic emotional artistic poof it's come from a decision to grind yeah to work that's it because we all have this I've been guilty of this too this romantic notion of the artist in fits of passion it's not that it's the guy is sitting at his desk working. It's That's the same. Absolutely it. It's the same in music where you write 50 songs for that 12 song CD, where you go out and play and play and play and play and play, which is what I'm trying to do to get better at stagecraft, to get better at playing the music, to be in front of more people and build an audience. Like, yeah. I, I know lots of people who are attracted to this notion of being a musician, but they don't play. Right. You got to play. You gotta write the poems. Yeah. And and looking at myself in the mirror, you gotta write the words if you're gonna do this. You know, I started two years ago, I was lucky enough to tour Europe for a month with Sarah Smith. And I made a decision I was gonna blog that every damn day. Right. I'm gonna write every day. So what that wound up being was the thirty thousand word output that we turned into a book. That's wonderful. You know, and it's so like you it, for me it gave me a time frame. It gave me a reason. I'm just going to do this every day. And it's, isn't it interesting how the work piles up when you commit yourself to doing the work? That's the, that's <laughs> the, that's the secret for right? sure. Yeah. So I, I love that, that you've sort of leveled up because of that. You yeah. Know? That That's, that's really exciting. And it's an, a great lesson for everybody who aspires artistically. Mm -hmm. I just did an episode I released recently with Tyler Olson, Tyler John Olson. He's an actor in Hollywood. Great. Right. And he's been in some films and he's like, he's, he's been in movies with Stallone and Schwarzenegger and a lot of Bruce Willis movies. And he's, his, his career is ascending. Right. So we talked about when he got the 20 years ago, when he got to Hollywood to start Mm -hmm. this process, it's like, Oh, just working a couple of jobs and I was in acting classes every night and auditions and whatever. But the, the part that got me was I was in acting classes every night. Yeah. Dude was acting every day and he still is, you know, he's, he's off shooting a Mel Gibson movie right now. When he gets back, he'll be back in classes or he'll be on the next project. It's like you keep developing your, your craft, right? Yeah. I loved that. Absolutely. I loved that. Yeah. And it's a good thing for me. I'm in a position where I can practice drums every day. Mm-hmm. And I do. Because I want to get better. And I want to be able to do the things I want to want Absolutely. To do, you know? It's so important for artists, you know? Yeah. You can't wait for inspiration to hit or whether you feel like it that particular day. You just have to, if you have the time, you have to sit your ass in the chair and try to write or try to drum or whatever it is that you're doing. And, you know, funny enough, one of the, one of the 
things that I take inspiration from are, are the CrossFit athletes. Like, really? Like, yeah, because they're not, I'm not into CrossFit. I'm not into any sort of uh, <laughs> exercise <laughs> regime whatsoever. But I am very impressed by those um, top tier CrossFit athletes who, you know, are being cheered on in these competitions. But ultimately, most of the time, 99% of the time, they're at home putting in the work, grinding it out. To no applause. To no applause. To, yeah. to no one. Yeah. And um, I, I just remember thinking to myself, you know, there's that, that's what it's about. You need to, you need to enjoy the solitude of your art, you know, or and the process and the process. Yeah. And if you don't, you're not going to, you're not going to advance you or won't. progress. So, and I lost that. That's one of the reasons I'm not writing fiction now. I lost that love of process. Right. I got really wrapped up in, wanting this to be really good and wanting people to acknowledge that it's really good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, like I know. I, absolutely. I, I got caught up in a lot of the immature stuff mm. that I didn't write my way through. I, I let it choke me, you know? Right. It's, it's not to say that I won't return to it one day. Sure. I hope I do, but that's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson to, to realize that the thing is not the book published and the review. The thing is the five months you sat at the desk yeah. That's where the joy has to be, right? And it is. It really is. And I mean, the fetish object of every writer is the book. Right. Right. And I think reason if you're lucky enough to get a first book out, it, it, the the real learning experience from that that particular moment in your life is that it fades those reviews the right. the sort of attention fades very very quickly and then you're left with the blank page again uh and i think you know veteran writers are very very aware of that i remember just because we we're talking about copeland uh he, he talking about every time he publishes a book he burns a copy he, he burns of a copy yeah yeah and, and he finds that very satisfying because it's in some way you're saying it's past it's yeah, beyond you it's, it's a ritual it's time to to do something else now he's an interesting man yeah he is <laughs> yeah what was i gonna say i forget i lost it I had, oh no worries i had a good thing was it hard to write the second book cold pains of surfaces yeah, it was, was second, right? it was um especially coming off a lot of uh praise for bonfires got a lot of attention for that yeah book. so for me, I knew it was going to be a sophomore exercise. And so right. just, I, I wrote that book in about three years time. So not really fast, but, but not slow either. And yeah, I was really worried, but I think it did ultimately make that book better than I, than it would have been otherwise yeah. having feeling like there was a tension on me. Yeah. Um, but you know, my, I have a, a good friend who lives in Hamilton who told me no one's, no one's worried about uh, another book from Chris Banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's sitting with bated breath, worrying about another book. When is the next Chris Banks book going to come out? Only you are, are thinking like that. Yeah. No one cares. Yeah. And once I heard that, uh, I just sort of, had that epiphany that oh yeah that's true right and so it started making the process of writing the second book much much easier when I, when I realized that no one cares you know it, it you care right so do it for you but no one else right. no one else cares you i've know? had the same realization with this podcast <laughs> nobody's waiting for the next episode it's like <laughs> relax dude it's okay it doesn't have to be perfect you know right it, it's was that paul vermeers that we're talking about Oh, it was my friend uh, Autumn Getty? Oh, it was Autumn Getty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have a Paul Vermeer story that's one of my favorite memories of my relationship with you. Okay. So the audience doesn't realize that Chris and I went to Teachers College twenty odd years ago. That's right. You are the second Alt House grad to appear on this show. Oh, cool. Uh, our mutual friend Mary Jennifer Payne was episode five or six. 
she was in my English class and she's now a young adult novelist. She's got, I think, five books out now. Oh, fantastic. So all of my friends are doing great literary things and I'm, well, walking around talking to them about it. But um, I think I came to your, was it 40th birthday party? Yes. And some poets were upstairs playing a UFC video game. Yes, that's true. And I'd never seen this game before, but I went upstairs to watch and and Paul Vermeers was one of them for yes. sure. I don't know who the other one was. And so I'm watching them and they're playing the game, punch, punch, kick, kick. And I picked up the manual and I'm just thumbing through the instructions for this game because it was evident that they were just button mashing. That's right. So I'm like, uh, how do you do a takedown? And I'm just looking, right? So, okay, it's fairly simple. And so the controller comes to my hand and it's me versus the great <laughs> Paul Vermeer. Yes. Mano a mano. And it's like, start. And he comes at me and I just took him down. And, <laughs> and it, it was about 10 seconds. Just knocked him right out, man. <laughs> down and out. And it was one of my favorite memories of video games. Oh, we had... <laughs> Poets and video games should be its own podcast. I remember it should be early in uh, probably 2003 playing some wrestling game with uh, Paul Vermeersh on um, a PlayStation 2. And there was a build your own wrestler. Um, I remember this game. Build yeah. your own wrestler uh, function in it. And we made all our wrestlers still look like Canadian poets. <laughs> 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 and made them fight against each other, which was hilarious. Oh, uh, man. Do you remember so who they fun. were? Well, I know Dennis Lee was definitely one of them. <laughs> I think Ken Babstock made an appearance, too. It was it was a lot of fun. I made a character in one of those games who just had really enormous hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, enormous hands, like the size of a body. <laughs> and he would just come across slapping. <laughs> hilarious. I missed that stuff. Yeah. It brings me think of your your uh, all night arcade poem. Yeah. Exactly. I, I love that poem. That's a great poem from uh, the Cloud versus Grand Unification Theory and if I ever do a selected, I think that'll be the title of the selected. Oh, really? Uh, poems, yeah, because uh that's one of my favorite poems that I've written. It's a very nostalgic poem yeah. in, in ways. Yeah. Uh it's about you know, time and and um, passing and uh, it's about obviously arcade culture in the eighties, but also, you know, finding uh, yourself um, swimming the waters of adulthood in your twenties and, and then the, the various challenges that come in your thirties and forties. So yeah, I like that poem a great deal too. There's a neat video that was made. Yes. My friend Dave Oka made that video for me. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that video. It's well, really cool. Again, Dave's uh, a great um, friend. Uh, and I'm very inspired by his work ethic. Dave works uh, full time as a teacher at my school, Bluebell Collegiate, teaching art and English. I teach English, and he only sleeps about three hours a night. Really? Guy, yeah, he's basically like a Terminator that's been sent to <laughs> Earth instead of destroying mankind. Uh, his whole purpose in life is to just create lots and lots of art. Interesting. Uh, and so. When I was doing midlife action figure, I remember th thinking to myself, be more like Dave. Be like Dave. Be like Dave. Right. He's What's Dave doing right now on his prep? He's got his lessons covered, but he's working on a drawing. That's great. Work on a poem. That's great. Yeah. So uh, he did it for me. I, I asked him if he would do a, a, this sort of video poem for me. And he, uh, he said, well, if I have time. And he went home for the weekend. And he came back on Monday. goes, it's done. Here you go. Yeah, it just was so fun, so fun to see it um, put together. My poem set to um, set to his uh, video art. Yeah, yeah, it was great, and it was like shots of old video games happening. Yeah, that's and it, right. And it went with the narrative of the poem. I miss arcades desperately. I absolutely do too. I try to explain arcade culture to my um, grade nine and ten students, and I said, "There's nothing like." Being in an arcade and that one kid who comes in, he's probably about nine years old and he's got $2 <laughs> in his pocket and everyone begins to whisper because he's the guy for that particular machine. Pinball wizard. Yeah. You know, whether it's pinball or Dragon's Lair, he's the guy who can get to the end of the entire game on one quarter. Dragon's Lair. Yeah. Oh, I struggled so hard with that game. I know. Because it was the cartoon one, right? That's right. It looked amazing. I, absolutely. 
And I can only last about five seconds. Like the first two moves, I'm done. My brother could get to the dragon. He could? Yeah, on one quarter. I've and, never seen that. And whenever he would come into the arcade, we would all sort of... The crowd would part? Yeah, crowd would part, <laughs> let him get to the machine. And there would be like this scrum of like skinny <laughs> little kids all huddled around the machine, you know, four bodies deep trying to watch this kid the legend kill kill the dragon yeah that's my my best friend i grew up in owen sound as you know two there were two public high schools one on each side of town my friend went to the other one and there was a a bowling alley within sprinting distance of the high school and they had video games there bowling alleys did in those days and they had uh tecmo wrestling or twa wrestling do you ever play that one that was one of my favorites (laughs) And it was a mad dash who could get to that game first. Because whoever got it would have it for the whole lunch hour. Right. Because you could play it out on one quarter. Awesome. And just play for an hour. And so half of the game was getting to the game. That's that's great. I miss arcades so much. I miss the music that they used to play. I miss the smell of cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. I, and I miss playing Galaga. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kids have no idea. I wanted to, I've had this romantic idea of opening a vintage arcade, which I think these things actually exist now, where you can go and it's the old games and they're still a quarter, not like two bucks like they are if you go to a place now. This is a romantic notion I have. Mm. But then the part of me comes in and says, how would you ever make money with that? And that's too bad that as you become an adult, you begin to ask yourself that question. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. But I would absolutely for one night only love to be able to walk into that again. It'd no, great. absolutely. And I think you can touch that sort of experience in a poem, or at least I can. Yeah. You know, you, you can't relive it, but you can touch that memory, you know, in a poem, which is what I find really exciting. But I think I do also say in that poem, All Night Arcade, that, you know, nostalgia is a verdict for not living well. And what oh, I meant by that yeah. is that, you know, nostalgia is it's a good thing on on the one hand but on the other hand it can it can eat you alive too if you let it and And it's uh, excuse for not being in the moment yes absolutely yeah that's an important thing and i think as you reach middle age as we have Mm -hmm. somehow yes uh i think it's very easy to get caught up in the past and if especially if you're dissatisfied with the present right this is the age that people come to where they're like how did this become my life Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and you have a choice at that moment to change it or to look back on what used to be which is a dangerous thing to do probably right yeah Yeah. you know so i mean in in your case for any artist the key is to keep working yes you know that's that's the thing right early on I i felt like the poem was really really important yeah uh and now sort of mid-career i feel like the the process is really really important yeah you know whether the voice is going to come through me today or not that is what is important the individual poems if you don't like an individual poem of mine meh you know it's okay that's okay it's by okay me. yeah it's not gonna phase me do you feel like it comes from beyond you in some way some in some ways yeah, yeah that i find the the best poems for me are the ones that surprise me right to the very end yeah have you ever had the experience of you wrote some stuff and then you set it aside i've had this experience it's really trippy mm-hmm. and then you come back to it a month or six months or a year later in my case and you read it and you go I have no recollection of writing. This. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That tends to be really good stuff. I know. That's <laughs> the thing, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have that experience all the time. Like I couldn't tell you, you know, the exact circumstances as to why I wrote a particular poem in this new collection yeah. right? because I don't have memory of it. I've probably wrote it, you know, between classes on yeah. a Tuesday afternoon, yeah. you know, just to try to keep myself busy, my brain active, the right. whole, right. the creative um, sluice gates open. Right. So, yeah. What happens when they open? Do you, do you begin with a line? I begin sometimes with a line. Yeah. Sometimes I begin with uh, a title. 
which is oh, really? weird. Yeah. yeah. I, I just like, I'll have an idea for a title. Like right now I'm, I've, I'm working on a poem. I really shouldn't talk about it because it's not done, but I just came up with the title mint condition and the idea of, you know, like comic books right. being kept in those little bags being in mint condition. And that's just the, that's the catalyst for this poem I'm working on right yeah, now. Being kept in mint condition, but not enjoyed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, that's actually a neat exercise. Um, thinking of book writers, novelists, if you're struggling, I have enough wisdom about writer's block to be able to talk about this. Mess around with titles. Just yeah. start brainstorming titles. And weirdly, sometimes stories will begin to emerge attached to those titles. That, that's right. So I've got like a collection of titles. I got no stories, but that can happen. It just gets you thinking about it, right? Right. St Stephen Wright once made a joke about how he was writing a book. He's got all the pages numbered. He's just got to fill them in now. <laughs> you know, that's kind of where I'm at these days. Do you want to give us another poem? Sure. All right. What do we got? Okay. Let me just uh, look through here. Okay. This is a poem called Witnesses. Okay. Okay. And again, I don't have any idea as to why I wrote this particular poem. It just it sort of came out in this sort of stream of conscious um Popular culture is in remission. Some people are watched like chronic illnesses. I wait for the next market crash, hip youth revolution, measles outbreak. I'll take three wishes, please, and maybe three more. Don't think about other centuries too much or your life will be disappointing. Depression is running amongst bulls or Chinese water torture. Our anxiety comes in 31 flavors. Our prosecutor goes off his meds. He's no good to us. You win the case on your own or not. Note, the weather never asks for help. The government wants more of that do-it-yourself attitude. Memories are orphans. Do you want dar jarling tea or chemotherapy? How many would like a choice? I miss poets who've died. Their poems stick around, witnesses telling the truth of what they know, but eventually most of us stop listening, start networking. You've been contracted to bear this bundle another day, to suffer fashions until the prognosis changes. I wear being like an ill-fitting coat with a few buttons missing. How long has it been since you played marbles or kissed a relative stranger? Keep pitching ideas until one hooks starts tugging. Something will emerge from the briny deep. Be yourself, they say, which has something to do with the gate closing, a hardship post, the self a ghost haunting a tower, an upper walkway. Make your peace with it. Yeah. What speaks to you about that poem? Well, I think that, that poem sort of speaks to the, the whole process of that the book came out was, you know, again, just this sort of free flow of associations. Uh, and I, what else do I like about this particular, particular poem? The ending was such a surprise to me. And, you know, I talk about depression in it. So a little bit of myself is in it, but ultimately, you know, and the idea of loss, a lot of the, the poets I grew up admiring are now starting to die off because yeah. they've become, older people you're the admired poet now <laughs> do you think about that um uh, i don't worry about that too much um if someone comes up to me and tells me they admire my poems i'm of course you know very um i'm a little bit embarrassed and a little bit <laughs> gratified um by that um i'm hoping when i retire from teaching that I i'm gonna do two things I'm going to write, yeah. as I always have, and hopefully I'm going to mentor some younger people, oh, you know, and yeah. and not, you know, tell them what to write, just tell them how to navigate their own head, you know, in right. terms their headspace in terms of writing. Um, that's what I'd like to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I find it interesting in that poem, some of your other poems, there seems to be a dissonance between pop culture mm. and what's really important. Yes. What's your take on that? Pop culture is not important. 
it's window dressing it's yeah. it's designer clothes it's uh you know fun to wear but ultimately it's not it's not important um so i i mean Stephen Dobbins to talk about him a little bit more. He's an American poet who's always quote worthy. He was saying that, you know, poetry's had a hard time of it in the postmodern era because sure. uh, emotion and sincerity has a difficult time mixing with uh, irony and distance. Right. And I think that's what I'm trying to do is m- mix some emotion and some sincerity with. Mm a little bit of irony, a little bit of distance. So I'll bring in elements of pop culture to ground the poem in a way, but then I'll quickly move away from it. No, it's interesting. It's, I don't know. It, I think while well, pop culture has always been rather thin mm. and it seems to be more, more thin, more publicly thin now sure. since everybody has a platform and everybody has an illusion to share. Right. Right. Um, I think it's important that we have poets who talk about something deeper than that. Yeah. And musicians and artists and filmmakers. You know, film is what it is. We still flock to the Marvel movie, but right. um, you know what's funny is that I don't know won't don't know why I'm going there, but probably the deepest and most metaphysical movie I've seen in the past ten years is Sausage Party. Right. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Dude, everybody makes fun of me because it's just supposed to be this dirty cartoon. Sure. It's got metaphysical levels, man, about how we create religion, about how belief affects our lives, you know, about what's real and what isn't. Really powerful. So film can do that. Poems can do that. Music can do that. Sometimes you have to look a little deeper than what's on right. Instagram. You know? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... uh it's important. So I'm glad that poets still exist. You know? Perfect. <laughs> thanks for being here. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. Uh, who should we be reading apart from Chris Banks? In terms of poetry? Yeah. Oh, I like a guy named Dobie Gibson. He's okay. uh, in the from the States. Uh, Matthew Zabruder. It's really fantastic. Uh, here in Canada, I recommend, you know, Paul Vermeersh. We've talked about him. And... Uh, you know, uh, Kayla Zaga, she's a great poet. There's, there's so many, I could sit here and just yeah. rattle them off. So yeah, yeah, it's hard to talk just about it two, about two or three, but Is those there? are the poets I'm really interested in. Also Bob Hickok and Dean Young, they're yeah. surprising and fun po- poets. Really? Yeah. That you, people will really enjoy. It can be fun. Poetry can be fun. It doesn't yeah, have to exactly. be all serious all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And playful. Like an right. E. E. Cummings kind of thing. Like, sure. And Chris Banks for those well, kind of wistful and fun, funny poems at times. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think Robert Frost said, I think it was Frost who said, you know, uh, a poem should begin in delight and end in wisdom. And W.S. Merwin sort of amended that by saying, if it doesn't begin in delight, it will never end in wisdom. Wow. That's weird. That's deep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think about that quite a bit. Do you? Yeah. yeah, that's great. What does it mean to you? It means I have to be enjoy- enjoying the poem. Right. If I'm not, right. I should stop what I'm doing and I should throw out. Yeah, throw it out because it's just uh, I'm affecting a voice or right. So it has you have to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, that's a lesson for everybody. Yeah. So go do what you enjoy. Right. Chris Banks, thanks for being here, man. Thanks, John. All right, good luck with the new book. Great, thank you. All right, cheers. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. Thank you as well to Chris Banks for a wonderful conversation. If you want to know more about Chris and the rest of my guests, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff for content that may or may not appear on the Facebook page. 
If you're into Apple Podcasts, please do me a favor and leave a rating and review of the show, preferably a positive one. That's all for this week, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you, and remember, good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. You've got it all wrong, you can't get it right Why don't you come down from off my back And won't you get yourself a job somewhere away from me Archers of Love, kids, check it out